Okay. So good morning, everyone. Um, again, my name is Becky Thomas, and I work for the Division of Medical Assistance and Health Services in the um, state program office for the personal preference program. Today, I'm going to be providing just a basic one-on-one -on -one or one-on-one -on -one about what the personal preference program is, um, how to access it through your Medicaid state plan benefit, some information about your budget calculation, the role of an authorized representative. We will touch on the difficulty of care information and how, uh, how to utilize this in your, uh, in your, through your managed care organization to receive assistance with ADL services. So with no further ado, I'm sharing my screen right now. Please uh, let me know if you can see it. Yeah, so nods. Okay, great. All right. So um, I apologize now for my lack of technical savvy. I'm thankful that Amy is here <laughs> to keep me on track. So we'll start here, sir, our, our, our first screen here, but let's move into what we're here to do today. So today our goals are to provide a better understanding of the personal preference program. We're gonna to get to do a walkthrough of the enrollment process. I know this is an area where there's a lot of questions. So I wanna make sure that we feel confident and comfortable with what that is like. And then we wanna have some discussion about understanding your questions about personal preference. So um, the best way to just to talk through PPP is we like to kind of, we like to take the, the experience of, you know, someone who may be enrolling in the program. So we try to make it more of a personal experience instead of me just like rattling off facts at you. We'll get to that later. So I want to start off by introducing um, a, a potential enrollee named Sarah. Uh, Sarah is 34 years old, lives by herself in a small ranch home that was left to her by her parents. She is diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and uses a wheelchair. She is cognitively alert, but has a severe weakness in all of her limbs. Despite her disability, Sarah is able to work part-time at the neighborhood library. Sarah is independent, however, requires assistance with getting ready for the day, both during the work week and the weekend. Sarah's sister and brother help when they can, but they have young families and aren't always available. Sarah is seeking reliable supports to assist her with getting ready each day. She noticed that as a member of NJ Family Care, she is eligible for personal care assistance services. She contacts her health plan for more information. So personal care assistance and the assessment. So everyone that is in New Jersey Family Care has access to personal care assistance services. So these are access to services based on an ADL need. So New Jersey has services for members who are financially eligible and meet the needs of activities of daily living to remain at home and in their community. These are called PCA services. Members of NJ Family Care Health Plan can conduct the state PCA assessment tool, which will detail the level of service in hours a member may receive based on their ADL needs. So this is um, an assessment that all the health plans use. It's a state created tool. There's no deviation on uh, per plan. Everyone uses the same tool. The members NJ Family Care Health Plan can contract with an agency to provide these services. The agency sends a qualified person to the member's home to help with these ADLs, such as bathing, meal preparation, and light housekeeping. New Jersey also has another way for NJ Family Care members to get these services that does not involve an agency. This is called a personal preference program. So this is where, so everyone starts in the same place. They're going to go through their managed health care plan to request an assessment, and then they can receive a choice. They can either have an agency provide the needs, or they can choose personal preference. What is personal preference program? Personal preference program offers members more choice, flexibility, control, and the opportunity to man manage their personal care services. Self-directed personal care assistance may not be the choice for all members, but it is an available option. With PPP, Sarah can choose a relative or friend to help her with ADL needs and pay them for these services within her approved budget. So this is just a, a comparison. Um, we did kind of a side to side to show the value of, of each service because we everyone may not want to do PPP, some may choose PCA agency, but for those that find that that is not the structure that works best for them, they may wanna choose PPP. So here we go through 
just a side by side. Um, so PCA would be good for members who don't have a desire or ability to manage their care. They would prefer to just go with the assessment, have the agency assign a worker and come into their home. Where on the, um, conversely, a member may want to choose how to manage their care and exercise con greater control over their experience. Members health plan will use the agency to provide services. The member can hire people they know to provide services. The agency will hire, train, supervise, schedule, and dismiss their caregivers if needed. In PPP, the member has supervisory control over the employee and how to handle and how to handle tasks. Tasks. So that will include, if you know, hire, train, supervise, schedule, dismiss, et cetera. This will be a part of your PPP experience as the essentially as the supervisor of your employee. The agency is responsible for timesheets and payment. A member's health plan is responsible for payment to the agency. So in the PPP, the member or a designated representative, which we will discuss in a further slide is responsible for approving timesheets and payment for services authorized in their CMP, also known as a cash management plan, more to come, for the fiscal agent to pay. The member's budget pays for the administrative costs of the services and the member authorizes the fiscal agent to pay the worker for the services provided under the approval, approved budget. So that's a lot of verbosity to essentially say, if you're in an agency, they do all that. They'll set up the time the person comes, it'll be a scheduled time, they'll come the same time every day, they'll provide your services and they'll go. On the PPP side, there's more nuance. You are essentially guiding your own care, but with, and with that, there will be some responsibilities that are gonna come with that. But it also means that you decide when your workers help you. If, it's, if you need assistance at five in the morning and an agency can't provide that, you may choose that the flexibility of having your own worker someone you know and trust can be there at five, then you get your services at five. So that's where that's where the trade-off and the value can come in in a self-directed uh, um, choice. The agency conducts supervisory, supervisory visits to ensure program compliance. So the fiscal agent, now I wanna be clear on a couple of things because this presentation is was written before our COVID experience that we're having right now. So let's be mindful of that. Fiscal agent will conduct an initial visit for enrollment and make quarterly visits as well as visit at the member or caregiver's request. So this is standard for the program when um, things are not in the situation that we're in currently. To just speak quickly about um, what has happened, the, um, the PPP with our fiscal agent, um, PPL, has worked to create a more um, a remote enrollment process. Everything is doing is being done over the phone right now so that there, we're not asking members to have people in their home that they don't know or aren't comfortable with. We also um, want to assure that workers are not bringing, you know, PPL is not bringing anything in and that PPL workers are also not bringing anything out just to be safe. We wanna ensure everyone's safety first and foremost. The agency is responsible for providing a backup plan. And then in this case, the fiscal agent will help the member develop a backup plan. You will develop your backup plan. Who's going to help you out in an emergency if you need someone? You can determine what that looks like. The agency is responsible for how the services are provided. The PPP, you will decide with your caregiver how the services will be provided. And the service is available only where agencies are located in the health plans network. We know that this can be a, a, a kind of a tough issue in certain parts of the state, but in uh, personal preference, you can get services wherever you have a worker who can provide them for you. So options counseling. So options counseling is that portion of, so you've had your assessment, now you get to choose. Do I want a PCA agency? You've just seen the options there where there might be pluses and minuses, or do I want peace? Do I want to go with PPP? Is the, the, the greater responsibility worth the flexibility to get the services I need and having someone that I know who knows me take care of me. Is that the best choice for me? So option of counseling for PPP. So the author, authorized hours will be completed from the assessment by your managed care organization. Members who choose traditional PCA services will receive the authorized hours. So I wanna be really clear on this point. If you receive agency and you're authorized for 40 hours, 
you will get 40 hours from your agency. It's important to note. Members who choose to self-direct through a personal preference program receive a monthly budget based on the, on the PCA hours. There will be a calculation into a dollar amount that is used to pay for services. And we're gonna, we're gonna walk through that. So I wanna make sure that the differences is clear and why the, the difference is there. And um, in this model, members are not restricted to purchase the same amount of hours for which they have been authorized. You get to make choices about the wage as long as it comply, complies with um, the minimum wage. You may also want to see if there's any sort of opportunity to use um, percent, essentially like if there's laundry, you don't have laundry uh, facility or any um, a machine in your home, you can put aside money to help pay for the cost of doing laundry at a laundromat. This is an area where it's helping with an ADL, which is laundry and uh, an IADL. It can assi assist you in that way with getting those needs met. So we're gonna get back to Sarah and talk about how all these discussion points that we've just had come back to a, a person in, in, a relatable, in a relatable way. So the PCA assessment has determined that Sarah is eligible for 25 hours. Her health plan provides option counseling, options counseling to determine if self-direction is for her. So part of the options counseling checklist includes the budget calculation process, understanding what that means, what it means to be an employer of record, the role of the authorized representative and whether one should be assigned to Sarah, and the completion of forms and enrollment processing. So let's talk through the budget calculation process. I apologize for this looking like a calculus trigonometry because uh, I'm not a math person. So I look at this page and I'm like, oh, but let's walk through it because it's actually um, not as scary as it looks. So we took Sarah's experience and it added in our calculations to show how the budget is calculated and what each nuance, each piece of that calculation looks like when it comes to having a PPP budget. So step one is we're going to take um, the multiply the authorized hours by the PC, PCA reimbursement rate. So in the PPP right now, the reimbursement rate for developing this calculation is $15. So we're going to take the 25 hours that she was assessed for, and we're going to times it by $15. So we get about $375. Then we're going to take that amount and we're going to calculate it for a month. So and to be mindful that every month, you know, some, you know, every month with the exclusion, you know, every month is 28 days. That's the old, the old, the, which month has 28 days? They all have 28 days. But we have some that have 30 and some have 31. So we're going to use a bookkeeping figure to capture all of that time. And it'll be um, 4.33. Instead of just timesing it by four, we're going to times it by 4.33 to get a monthly dollar amount, which is $1,623.75. That's the monthly calculation of her 375 times 4.33. So this is where, in this piece is where we delineate um, from PCA versus PPP. The member receives 87.5% of the monthly budget to purchase services and other participant fees. So there's a, there's a buy-in, there's a cost to participating in PPP. 12.5% is reduced from the monthly budget to pay for costs associated with being the employer of record. So from that, we're gonna do the calculation times 0.875 and we get to the amount of $1,420.78. That's the monthly budget that Sarah has to receive to purchase her services that she wants to utilize for her needs. And that's where the big difference is between if she went to an agency, she gets 25 hours. Here, she gets a budget to determine how to receive her services. So this figure represents a cash out benefit. Sarah gets to spend to purchase services through the program. Sarah must pay her workers at least minimum wage, which right now is $11. One one of one one twenty one will then increase to twelve dollars, and then she recognizes that the higher rate of pay per hour, the fewer hours she will be able to purchase. So this is a, another nuance where you the personal preference program allows for payment at the minimum wage up to twenty five dollars an hour. 
but you have to be mindful that what you pay that person per hour will decrease the amount of services that you receive. So if you're paying someone $20 an hour, when you cash that out, you may only wind up getting 15 hours a week as opposed to the 20. That's really bad math. Please don't check my math. It's terrible. But if you are asking for a higher dollar amount, the services that are available out of that budget will decrease because it's essentially a salary. It's a, 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 a designated amount of money that you have to determine how you want to use it to receive your services. So what does it mean to be the employer of record? Under PPP, Sarah will have some new responsibilities and a great deal more choice and freedom in terms of the services she receives. Sarah or her authorized representative will be the employer of her PCA services. This means she will make decisions and manage and supervise her employees like a small business. As with any small business, there will be costs involved such as bookkeeping, taxes, payroll, as well as workers' compensation and overhead. These costs are deducted from her budget, including payroll taxes, workers' compensa compensation, and check processing fees. The balance of her budget will be applied to the services she needs to remain in her home and community. So now we're going to delve into the role of the AR. Um, so Sarah may choose to appoint or be asked to appoint an authorized representative to help her manage her PPP services. The health plan and Sarah discuss the role of the authorized representative. Um, so these are some really key points that we, uh, we try to make sure everyone that is asking to do this role are very clear on. Um, an AR can be anyone over 18 years of age that the participant knows and trusts like a family member or friend. However, the AR cannot work for the participant and cannot be paid. This is considered a conflict of interest. And um, that is something that we would we would monitor in the program through managed care and through the and through the fiscal agent to assure that that is not occurring. And AR supports the participant as needed to fulfill the participant's responsibility as the PPP participant and employer. So the AR must be present in the participant's life and readily available to provide the participant's necessary support. An AR will support the participant to process paperwork, hire and supervise the participant's workers, oversee services from providers, sign timesheets and invoices, and follow up with the public partnerships customer service agent or the participants financial consultant if any issues come up. So I think we're, you know, we're sensing the theme here that if you, us, you agree to be the AR, you are working essentially on behalf of the participant and anything that you do is at their, their benefit. You are working for them as them. And that's a lot of responsibility. So it's something that we ask our um, anyone that offers to do this role to, to be clear on what their responsibilities are. The AR must be present for all scheduled visits and calls with the participant's financial consultant. And AR must meet with the financial consultant during enrollment to ensure they understand their role and responsibility. And an AR must complete a designation of representative representative form agreeing to act as the role. So the enrollment process. After completing options counseling with the health plan, Sarah has decided to participate in the personal preference program and really likes the fact that she can direct her own program and act as the employer of record. She has also determined that she will not require the assistance of an authorized rep, but is happy to know that the option is available if the need arises. Sarah completes the enrollment paperwork and her health plan facilitates the next steps of the enrollment process. So this is, um, this is what we fondly call um, the busy slide. I try to at least make it pleasant to look at. So we're gonna walk through the process. Um, and of note, there are pieces of this that have changed, as I said, based on COVID. Um, so to start, we'll start at number one, she contacts her health plan for an assessment and an application. The health plan will complete the assessment and the application. And then the health plan will then take the information that's completed to PPL or send that data to PPL. PPL will accept the data and then they will start setting up Dana, or sorry, Dana, Sarah, to be her own business. So that means getting her 
um, employer identification number with the IRS, um, acquiring workers' compensation for her, helping her onboard new staff, and getting her ready for her essentially her good to serve status. Sarah is entered into the, the portal, which is an online portal where you can um, participants and their workers can go in and review status of uh, their, their pay, look at their enrollment information, make sure their address is correct, communicate if it needs to be changed or updated, things of that nature. So it's their, their view into their enrollment process and their participation. Um, and then they will also assign a financial consultant. Oh, I think I'm getting an early morning. Thank you, sir. Sorry, everybody. Coffee delivery is our utmost importance in this Thomas household. Um, okay, so moving on. So once the financial consultant has been assigned, the financial consultant will reach out to Sarah to schedule a meeting. Now, in the past, it would have been a face-to-face -face in the home, and um, that would have been uh, a meeting where they would go through all the rules, responsibilities, sign off on any required paperwork, um, that's where they could also deem if they're um, a difficulty of care, just to, um, Zinke had asked me to make sure that I mentioned what the difficulty of care is. So the difficulty of care is a an, uh, designation when someone lives in the home with someone who has a disability that they are allowed to um, not file, uh, they will, based on the form, the, uh, the feds will not pull taxes out for someone that has this, des this difficulty of care designation. There's a form that you can request to fill out. There's criteria that will be met. This is also available on the uh, PPL website where you can look it up under their FAQs regarding information around the difficulty of care to verify if that is um, the right designation for you. I also recommend that if you have um, a, an accountant that you just verify that this is the right selection for you before completing the paperwork, but want you to be sure that you know that during this process, this is an option for you to explore if it does in fact um, have impact for you and your situation in your home. So while we're doing, uh, while they're in the home filling out paperwork, they're also going to learn about their, uh, they're gonna talk about the cash management plan. They're, and through the cash management plan, and I, I you know, there's been um, discussion about how they're essentially trying to show based on what services do you have from other programs? What services do you have in place that are formal and informal? What is it that you need the PPP to fill in your day-to-day -day needs based on your assessment of what is it that you see as a need in your home? When do you want those services delivered and who would you like to, who would you like to provide them? This is when you can decide, you can share who you are hiring, you can decide on what wage you would like to pay them and they can help you determine the impact on the budget availability based on those wage determinations. You can also discover, de determine if there's something that you would like to potentially save, do a set aside where you can save money. If you, if you wanna do a small percent of your budget to save for say a washing machine, which would actually lift the need for uh, laundry services. There's a whole process for that where you can talk that through your financial consultant if that's an option for you that has value. So there is all sorts of different opportunities that you can discuss with your financial consultant as it relates to that. Um, next, the financial consultant is going to take all this information and complete the enrollment process. They'll get the EIN assigned from the IRS. I do want to make it clear that this is um, definitely an issue that we talk about with our um, with our PPP and our DDD family uh, of programs is that if you have an established EIN in another program, um, there may be a need to either assign a different employer of record, or if you choose to use the EIN in the PPP program, the IRS will ask that you have a, what they call a 147C letter. PPL will work with you to request this letter from the IRS so that your EIN will be clean and that they will assure that there's no other business attached to it, and then they will uh, be able to reassign the EIN to your program. Pardon me, I have a cat who wants to eat my breakfast. Enjoy the working from home. I'm so glad that will be recorded for posterity. 
<laughs> um, so, um, so those are some some key portions of that discussion as we get ready for uh, to begin enrollment. One other piece that is important to know for the first month of enrollment for any and all members is that what will be coming out of the budget that first month is a workers' compensation cost. It will impact service delivery for the first month. All members will be paying it upfront at time of uh, their first month. So the first month, and then it will be renewed annually. So if your first month that you're ready to go is November, you're gonna pay, the workers' comp fee will come out. And then November, every year thereafter, you'll have to redo your finance, your, uh, your budget to allow, allow for that cost annually. But it's part of being in the program. It's a requirement of the program. So just wanna um, clarify that up front as well as a kind of an important take back about workers' compensation. So once they, the, uh, everything is completed, uh, the member will enroll on the first of the month, of the following month. They will receive an update that they are ready to go, that their worker can, is ready to start work. Everything is in place for them. The workers pay, you know, payment, um, papers are in place. They'll have filled out all of their requirements. And then they will let managed care will also be aware of their, um, that they're ready to go. And then um, once they get their go-to date and everything's in place, services may begin. Of note, a member can choose while they're awaiting enrollment, they can stay in their agency. If they're receiving agency, they can stay in the agency until PPA, PPP picks up the first of that next month. So if you're receiving PCA up until November 30th and you're starting PPP December 1st, your health plan can coordinate that with you. We don't ever want anyone to think that they can't have PCA while waiting for PPP. They absolutely can. It's part of the, the options counseling uh, toolbox that we've developed with uh, managed care to make sure that if a member needs services, they have access to them. You may choose to waive PCA and say, no, I'll wait. I'll wait for my PPP to get finished. But you always have access to that option while you're waiting for PPP enrollment. So this is just some basic resources that we can go. I just want to make you aware of where you can go to ask questions, gain knowledge, et cetera. Um, so we'll start with PPP uh, or with PPL. Their, this is their customer service numbers, their fax number, they have an email that's available to you, and their website. Um, there, uh, there's some valuable tools there for basic information. They have FAQs, they have forms available source of information that is a few, you know, I'm, I'm respect everyone is a pretty is a pretty busy individual, but if you're ever in the mood to kind of hunt around and, and learn any information, it's a valuable place to, to go. Um, next, all the numbers located next to the health plans here, these are their direct PPP unit offices at the health plan. So if you are interested in PPP with whatever health plan you were enrolled in, you can call them at the number that's directly there and say, I would like to enroll in the PPP. And they have options counseling that they will provide for you. There's forms that they will share with you to get you rolling. If you already have a current PCA assessment, they can walk you through that. If you have acquired a change in condition, you, need to, you can ask them for a potential reassessment based on that change. Or if you're brand new and this you're new to Medicaid, and this is a, a new opportunity, you can let them know I'm new and I would like to be assessed for PCA to seek an option for PPP. So they're your direct link to the PCA benefit and um, enrollment into PPP. And lastly, we have um, the program office that um, I manage is uh, we have our own helpline that we can help direct questions, help you if you're struggling with getting answers from either your health plan or PPL well, we happy to help you. And then we also have our own page. Um, feel free to use that liberally to get any information. Some of this information will be located there for you as well, but it's also just a, a good place to, um, if you want to, again, with all your extra time, <laughs> do additional reading. Um, but there are sources there for um, some basic information about the program. And that brings us to questions. Um, and uh, I'm hoping that we have plenty of time to go through whatever questions you have. So um, Amy, 
you wanna, uh, can you help me with that? <laughs> Absolutely, Becky. Um, so the first question we have in the chat box is, will we have access to download your slides? Um, sure. Um, I, I shared the, um, I shared the uh, presentation with Amy. And I don't know, Amy, if that's something that you can post or something, is that possible? Sure. Okay. Yeah, so we generally share them. Um, we, when we do a presentation of this nature, we uh, share the information in our weekly newsreel that goes out every Friday. If you're not already subscribed to that, you can just email me and I'll put my email address in the chat box and request it and I'll, I'll forward it to you personally if you're not already getting the newsreel. Um, next question we have, and I think Zinke answered this, um, is the personal preference program with DDD, and we have Zinke's response is that it is under the Division of Medical Assistance and Medical Assistance. Is that accurate? It's Zinke? Division of Medical Assistance and Health Services. Health so services. just to kind of, I mean, if I'm being redundant, please accept my apology. I will be totally honest with you when I came to DMOS. I needed the kind of alphabet soup explanation. So um, the DMOS is essentially Medicaid. We, we help oversee the Medicaid enterprise with the assistance and support of DDD, DDS, DCF. We all work together under the umbrella of the Medicaid enterprise. So in the DMOS, our focus is um, a lot on the um, state plan process. We work on MLTSS, long-term care. So um, PPP comes under that umbrella. That means DDD individuals through their, their state plan benefit have access to PPP and it will cover the state plan portion of those needs. Oh the DDD as it comes into place is how they um, they help on the waiver related services that come that are above and beyond the state plan that only DDD individuals have access to. And just, I would just want to give a, a shout out to Zinke who really does a great job understanding and explaining the difference between the two. We've had a lot of conversations where I um, am always so impressed by how well she, she understands that it's a very unique line and she really does understand it. So you're in very good hands with her, with her information and her ability to relay that information to you. So um, just wanted to kind of give credit where credit is due. Thanks, Becky. Uh, for those that are, are not familiar with Zinke, she is the family mentor with Values Into Action. And if you are a person or family member receiving supports through us, um, you can reach out to her for questions or consultations as well. And then the next question we have, Becky, is, is this budget separate from DDD? Yes. Totally different. Good question. Thank you. And the following question is, what kind of costs are associated with being the employer of record? Is this basically the income the agency would generate to administer the PCA program for the individual? And if that is the case, does PPP not include this charge? So um, that's an excellent question. So yeah, essentially it's the, the bookkeeping. So the, the 12 and a half percent that is automatically taken out is related to, you know, tax filings, overhead, like you said, um, bookkeeping fees, things of that nature, all the kind of behind the scenes things that are occurring at the PCA agency. That's what those funds are, are, are for the overhead for having your own business essentially on the PPP side. That and in that 12 and a half percent, it does not include the cost of workers' compensation because that's directly, you know, based on your, your employee of record business that you have as a PPP participant. And then the other fees are, are check processing fees that are done monthly. Lesser or less dramatic uh, events in the lives of people. Sorry about that. No worries. Muted that person. <laughs> um, then Zinke made a, um, a mention here with PPP, there is no agency. This allows the staff to be paid at a higher rate, which um, is a great point. Thank you for sharing that, Zinke. Uh, the next question is, is the difficulty of care waiver only for the employer or can the employees submit a difficulty of care waiver as well? It would be for the employer who, or the employee who is filing their um, taxes um, for submitting. So essentially you're, when you, when you are a worker, you are considered just um, a, a regular worker. So you have to do your I-9, 
you're going to have to do your W-4. So the difficulty of care form is something that is agreed upon by both both individuals that are in the home, they both have to sign it and approve it. And that would be used. That's why um, I'll be honest with you, I'm not a, um, I'm not the strongest as far as being a, a, uh, an accountant, but it has value for the home, who, whoever, whomever is in the home. Now the individual that is the participant isn't going to be collecting pay in this scenario, but they both have to agree to the difficulty of care um, for on the form that this is uh, in, in fact their relationship within the home they will impact the worker as they submit for taxes as they pay their taxes thank you um next question is um when a family says that their ppp hours are not enough or their hours got cut the actual situation is that the allotment of weekly funds is the issue so is it just that they may be paying their support person a higher rate? There's absolutely potential for that. So part of being in, that's why I made the distinction about an agency versus the program. If you really need the hours, if the hours is the need, then an agency is an option. In PPP, it may be, that's definitely an area that I would recommend reviewing with your financial consultant, because if you're paying them a higher rate, that the budget is not able to cover based on the need. So they were assessed for certain need based on the calculation, the wage you want to pay, there isn't enough money there to support the hours and the compensation. So that is definitely a place to review. Um, and just to, be, just to be mindful that managed care, when they do the PCA assessment, it's based on the clinical need of the individual. It's not based on the budget calculation in PP. Thank you. Um, and as you're talking, mentioned the financial consultant, Becky, it makes me want to ask a question. Where does the financial consultant come from? Is that somebody that? They work at PPL. So they, okay. PPL is our financial, we say, we fiscal intermediary, financial management service, fiscal agent. So for the PPP program, everyone that is enrolled in the program has a financial consultant. We have one person that is assigned to them. Yes, I acknowledge the need that they change often. Right now, um, PPL is increased hiring. They wanna make sure that they have enough staff on hand to make sure everyone's getting the support they need. But everyone is assigned one person to help them. So they start off with um, a training specialist. When they first enroll, they have a unique <coughs> orientation and training specialist that gets them from enrollment through their first payroll. And they stay with that individual until all the paperwork is done, everything is enrolled, They've started the program. Um, they've made sure that the employee has submitted and received a successful time payment, et cetera. Once that is assured, then they will be transitioned to a financial consultant who will then be responsible as their touch point person and for their quarterly check-ins, which I mentioned before are now being done on the phone. But um, that's a, a feature that the PPP offers that really creates that kind of person-centered one-to-one um, touch base. Um, I think some people may view it, you know, we've had experiences where some people are like, I love my financial consultant. She's, she or he is like family. And then we've also heard that like my financial consultant has changed so many times it's frustrating, which is all valuable feedback. I need, I need to hear all of it um, because we want to make sure that that component of the PPP has value. That's an important element of supporting. Um, just, just to provide some um, kind of intense numbers, when the program started, um, when we, when PPL started the program, there was 9,500 people. We are now over 20,000 people enrolled because we really want to support people having a choice of who provides their care, how they receive their care, and that they feel safe at home and that the home, their home is a place where they are surrounded by the people who care for them and those people are able to be compensated to care for their family members. So that's that's all a part of that holistic point of view of a person is that meeting that need, the person within their, their chosen place with their chosen caregivers. So I know that's a lot, that's a huge expansion. I don't think any of us expected it to be like that, but we also never thought that it couldn't be that way. So we have been working to to keep allowing this to be a viable option for, for families and individuals that are seeking this type of service delivery. 
Is um, PPL the only fiscal intermediary that one can use through PPP, or can you also use Easter Seals as an FI? So that great question. Currently, at this time, PPL is the only FI for PPP in the DMOS. Um, DDD has its own unique situations, um, which I am not an expert to speak on, so I will be respectful of my DDD colleagues and not try to speak out of turn. But in the PPP, yes, PPL is the only fiscal intermediary. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question we have in the chat is, can the balance of hours not be used? Oh, sorry, can the balance of hours that are not used, can they be carried over to use for goods and services? So we don't necessarily do a carryover. What we would allow is if you build in your goods and services within your budget each month, then you can use it that way. So essentially, you uh, we don't do any carryover because we do it on a, um, a monthly budget. So your monthly budget, I'm gonna again use rough, rough numbers. Your budget is $100. If you use 99.99, that penny is just not put, nothing happens with that penny. Nobody's getting it. Essentially, your health plan will approve up to $1,000. Whatever you use is what's actually paid. Whatever is not used is, is, not, um, is not paid out in any way. But if your budget is $100 and you want to set aside a piece of that for goods and services is part of your CMP, you can do that and you can build a little, like you can save month to month towards something specific. Like I was mentioning, you can either use it towards laundry. So if you know there's a laundry expense, instead of paying someone to do the laundry, you may pay someone, you may pay for um, your worker to maybe drop it off, or but you can pay for, um, you can get coins to pay for the laundromat, that type okay. of thing. We don't pay for detergent, but we'll pay for the coin. We'll get you, you can get coins to pay for doing a laundry at the laundromat. Those are the types of goods and services you would explain to, with your financial consultant. What That's where we were saying like, what are your needs? What do you need done? I need help with laundry. Okay, what helps, what assistance do you have? What assistance don't you have? How can PPP help you get those needs met uniquely for you? Those types of, those are the types of nuances that the program can help you with. So if you want to save towards a washer, they can put a set aside for a few months pick, and then you'll save your money. Then they'll help you, just, they'll help you. You'll get a, essentially they'll get a cashier's check that can help to whatever place that you decide. Like say you find one at Best Buy or you find one um, that you really like and it's, a, it's the right price point. They will then get, they will write a cashier's check to Best Buy for you to make that purchase. We're always mindful of anything that brings money into the member may have a financial eligibility impact. We don't want any members losing eligibility financially because of something like saving towards a washing machine is somehow then put in, a, in, a, in an individual's account. We won't do that. Because we don't want them to, sub, you know, in an eligibility check, but well, you have this ton of money sitting here, what's that for? So we wanna make sure that all the processes keep eligibility um, financial eligibility criteria safe. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The next question is also a comment. It says, my daughter is already receiving PPP. All is going well, thank you. We received a letter about moving to EVV, electronic visit verification technology. Does mm -hmm. it need to move to this? So I'm going to do the ultimate in dodging questions and say this, um, there is forthcoming tons of EVD information. Um, with Zinke support, we are hoping to do a large scale explanation of the EVD, what it means in self-direction and what that will look like. I've been asked today to not discuss that directly because I wanna make sure that all the information I'm sharing is the correct information and you all hear it from one place, the right place. So I apologize for the dodge on the question. I will take it back that people are saying we need this information because I appreciate your feedback and more to come. And um, I, again, I hope that that will allay your fear that there is something forthcoming, absolutely. Yes, thank you, Becky. Mm -hmm. um, so we will be hosting um, an EVV Q&A and rollout session on December 10th. I'll be sharing that invitation with you guys in the newsreel. 
uh, and Zinke will be presenting on that in December. So um, keep an eye out for that information coming this Friday. Um, next question is, a friend is currently enrolled into PPP. He is considering changing his health plan from Medicare and Medicaid to Aetna Assure Premier Plus HMO D slash SNP. Will this impact PPP plan? So no, absolutely. So if um, the, in, the member is interested in going into a dual um, special needs plan, uh, PPP have, will have not be impacted at all. This is a this is a Medicaid specific program. Um, I know Aetna is joining the the SNP um, platform within Medicaid, and um, PPP is a continued portion of that. It should be seamless. You should not see any issues whatsoever. And if you do, you have my helpline number. Please call me. And we'll figure it out. And then we have a comment and a question. Uh, good question regarding EBV. Uh, it says, I also need clarification here. My understanding is that if the employee lives in the participant's home, they do not need to utilize this new method of reporting time. Is that correct? Um, on that one, I will provide an answer. Yes, that is correct. That's just a known entity. I'm not sharing any, <laughs> not sharing any trade secrets. But yes, if you live in the same home, EBV does not apply. And that, yeah. that, that, that's, that's all I can say. <laughs> yes. There was also last week, uh, DDD, um, you know, during their weekly, I'm sorry, bi-weekly COVID updates, they covered EVV as well. And um, that's uh, PowerPoint presentation and slide information will be shared in this Friday's reel as well for those that still need more clarification on EVV um, before the December 10th um, presentation that we're hosting. Excellent. Um, the next question we have is, can you be enrolled in both PPP and DDD PCG self-directed program? Uh, yes, it is possible, but this is where we talk about the employer of record scenario that can get a little dicey. So in the personal preference program, the participant is required to be the employer of record. Um, where, so for example, if an individual is um, a child, um, even, even a kid, they're considered the employer of record. However, they would be required an authorized representative to speak for them, which could be, you know, um, mom or dad can be the authorized representative. And if mom is the authorized representative, dad can be the worker. So we can still keep that bubble. If someone is duly enrolled in both programs, they can't use the same employee identification number in both because they are not, the programs are not um, based on the way the programs are designed, the EINs can't be shared. So um, it's, it is a sticky, a sticky situation. A lot of folks in the DDD may, um, would have to consider taking another look at who the employer of record would be on the DDD side, which I respect and understand that's not everybody's ideal scenario. But if the DDD programs allow for another person to be the employer of a record, that may be an option because in the PPP, very strictly, the individual has to be the employer of record that is receiving the services. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And that's all the questions in the chat here. Um, if anybody wants to unmute themselves and ask a question, you're welcome to do that as well. We have until scheduled until 11 o'clock today, um, or we can end early, um, being that there's no other questions in the chat. We have a thank you from Catherine. You're welcome, Catherine. Thanks for attending. And thank you for answering the EVV question about living with the sure. person. I figured no one needs to wait on that one. That one we could say, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, I was getting that information from other parents and I was confused. So thank you for okay. confirming that. Absolutely, sure, Natalie, not a problem. And I know we also, we talked a lot of acronyms here today. I know some sure. in our world, it's kind of like alphabet soup. So if um, anybody has any questions about the different um, acronyms that we use, um, Values has um, like a resource guide of an alf of the alphabet soup, basically. So if you would like to receive a copy of that, you can just email me. I'll put my email address in here once again. And also, um, if you would like, if you're not subscribed to the Friday Newsreel and you want to receive a copy of this presentation, please email me your request and I can follow up with that um, for you as well. 
And uh, Action has a YouTube channel. So if you want me to, don't want to personally email me, the presentation today will be um, live on YouTube. Well, I shouldn't say live, it'll be a recording of it on YouTube later today if you prefer to access it that way on our, it's just Values Into Action New Jersey um, on YouTube. Amy, I did see a question. Someone mentioned having an 18 year old son about wanting to get started. Oh yeah, that just, I just saw that. It right just popped up, yeah. And um, so um, just to answer that question, if your son is enrolled with a managed healthcare plan, um, Aetna, Horizon, whichever, um, the presentation, um, I got that one, it shows the managed, whatever health plan the, your son is enrolled in, you can call the number that is provided, which when you, when you have access to the slides, you can just call that number. And, and request um, PCA assessment and an interest in PPP enrollment. I hope that it gets to the to your your question. There is another question too: is how much money is allotted per participant? It's based on your assessment. So if you're assessed for um, 40 hours, then it'll be that calculation. Remember, we said the calculation of $40 times $15 or 40 hours times $15. If you're allotted for 10 hours, it'll be 10 hours times $15. So it's really based on whatever your assessed need is. So if there's a higher need, then the budget would be larger. If there's a smaller need, then the budget would be smaller. It's just, you know, based on that. I'd like to thank you for this great presentation. It was very informative. Um, I just like to ask when it comes to transportation and your mm -hmm. participant would um, has to go to a day program and the worker takes them to the day program, would that be considered um, errands or like what category would that fall under when you're doing the timesheets? So transportation is not necessarily, technically, um, well, I guess you would use that as a good in service, but I would verify how they calculate transportation on the PPP side versus the DDD side. Because on the DDD side, that would be um, considered part of a waiver. And I'm not clear, um, I would ask managed care because when managed care does their assessment, transportation is inc included as an ADL. So that's a nuance that I would steer on the, um, the clarity on that. All right, thank you. That's a great question. Thank you for asking it. Uh, I saw a question about the assessment. So the PCA assessment, is a, um, it's a tool that's created to capture uh, an individual's experience in his or her home um, with what supports are available or not available as they would go through a day with uh, any type of activities of daily living, dressing, toileting, food prep, you know, um, eating, uh, all sorts of ambu ambulation requirements. Um, there's a cognitive element. So, I, I've seen the NJ cat and this is a little, it's, it's not as intense. Like the NJ cat's pretty intense. Like I, I can definitely say that's, that's a really intense assessment. This is similar, um, except that it's done by, oh, we ask that it be done by a registered nurse. So that it's, it's um, because Medicaid is, you know, Medicaid, especially in state plan, our focus is on the clinical need. That's the requirement for Medicaid is that it's based on um, a clinical need. Um, waiver is when we start looking, we are able to start looking at the, what can we add to that need in the waiver program? The beauty of PPP is that it can be kind of get to do a little of that in PPP, we just have to follow the assessment as it's written so that we're making sure that we're capturing what someone needs and we're not missing it when we do the calculation uh, based on the hours they're assessed for. A couple of things to be clear on is that like an assessment isn't gonna capture certain things like my son needs to um, go to the store to go shopping for clothes. That's not a medical need, there isn't a, there isn't a um, a clinical component to that. So that's not gonna reach the level of the PPP assessment. I hope that makes some sense. It's really based on keeping you safe and in the home and adding that to the continuum of home and community-based settings and supporting the ability for an individual to be 
to live a fulfilled and enjoy enjoyable life in a community surrounded by choice and family and friends. You're very welcome. <laughs> That's all the questions I see here in the chat. A lot of thank yous. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Zinke is a very, uh, she's a very focused woman. And for that, I appreciate her, her continually asking. And I was really happy we could make this happen. So thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Becky. We appreciate you being here today. All right. Take care. And um, please use the help line if you have any questions. And, um, and you can just say when you talk to them that you that you spoke with me and um, we can at least start to try to get uh, either a phone call or an email chat going. Never an issue. Or Amy or Zinke can also reach me. So happy to help. All right. Thanks, Becky. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks. You too. Bye, guys. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, Becky. Bye. Bye. Bye.